crooked Hillary just woke up to the worst news of her life with what Trump announced this morning. President Donald Trump just laid a smackdown at the feet of his 2016 Democratic opponent Hillary Clinton today. Trump took to Twitter this morning and called crooked Clinton the worst, and biggest, loser of all time, and he added, she just can't stop, which is so good for the Republican Party. Hillary, get on with your life and give it another try in three years. This would ensure President Trump wins a second term in a landslide considering that today she has an approval rating lower than President Trump has. The tweet was likely in response to Clinton's constant attacks on Trump, where she tells him to take responsibility for the sexual assault allegations leveled at him while at the same time applauding Al Franken's response to sexual assault allegations against him. Let's all keep in mind that this political hack has spent the last 20 plus years defending her husband, former President Bill Clinton from multiple allegations of molestation and sexual assault, while at the same time dragging his accusers through the coals and branding them as bimbo eruptions. Yup, that sounds like the champion of women we know Kerry Clinton to be. Hillary is retired, but courtiers help her maintain the appearance of importance. The funniest episode in the protective yet revealing new Hillary Clinton profile arrives when we learn that this sad, unemployed, 69-year-old lady is so desperate to keep her self-image alive that she still employs flunkies and retainers to treat her as though she actually were the president, or the secretary of state, or a president-in-waiting, or at very least the leader of the opposition. Her longtime loyalists are so happy to bustle around her in the service of maintaining the illusion that, after she takes an hour away from it all to exercise, her communications director, Nick Merrill, breathlessly updates her on everything that's happened in the political world in the last three score ticks of the minute hand. Her profiler, Rebecca Traster of New York Magazine, obviously a great admirer but one who declines to throw herself overboard from reality for the sake of giving Hillary more company bobbing about in the sea of fancy, writes that Clinton listens to the barrage of updates, nodding like a person whose job requires her to be up to date on what's happening, even though it does not. Ouch! Hillary Rodham Clinton isn't merely in a state of denial. She has become Bruce Willis in the sixth sense. Politically speaking, she is dead, but she doesn't know it. Her staffers are so many Haley Joel Osments, too kind, and too attached to their salaries, to tell her that her career is over. She doesn't need briefings. She doesn't need to do interviews. She doesn't need to write the book she is writing, after so many indigestible volumes, why bother with one more? She doesn't need to stake out a politically nuanced position on James Comey's firing or scramble to get out in front of the resistance parade. She lost two exceedingly winnable presidential campaigns in hand and virgin fashion. There is no demand for her to run again and there is nothing left for her except to receive whatever ceremonial honors and sinecures may come her way. She has been handed her political retirement papers by the American people. She's done. Clinton tells Traster. Vaguely, take me out of the equation as a candidate. You know, I'm not running for anything, and indeed she isn't, right now, since this isn't an election year. Yet nothing Clinton does these days makes sense unless you keep in mind that she actually thinks she could run again. Take her Wellesley address on Friday, utterly bonkers for a commencement speech. Newly minted graduates expect to hear something useful or at least funny or informative or, failing all else sentimental. Clinton did a bit of this, then started lobbing word mortars far over their heads at Donald Trump, making the kinds of Nixon comparisons that every Democrat, and lots of non-Democrats, have been making for months. Why bother pursuing such a trite theme? Because Clinton was eager to show the Washington political hacks that she is still a tough operator, a leader of the anti-Trump movement, a player. She was, in other words, campaigning. To all appearances, the game is long over. Yet she is still on the field, because the game isn't over to her. Hey, there's another election in three and a half years, folks. And need we remind you who won the popular vote? Hillary Clinton, there are a lot of questions about 2016 elections legitimacy 015115 powered by Clinton was eager to show the Washington political hacks that she is still a tough operator a leader of the anti-Trump movement, a player. In Traster's profile, Clinton, 
again, deflects attention from her own self-evident flaws to blame her defeat on others. She again blames James Comey, with zero acknowledgement that her own actions to evade scrutiny of her email were the cause of Comey's entirely justified and indeed shockingly forgiving criminal investigation. She, again, blames the Russians, even though even she acknowledges that the actual content of the WikiLeaks emails from her own fellow Democrats was inconsequential. She, again, blames misogyny, a non-falsifiable theory with no evidence behind it except that citizens supposedly came up to her and said things like, gosh, I'm not sure we're ready for a woman president, with the added fill-up that women who voted against her are internalized misogynists. She blames the suppression of the vote, particularly in Wisconsin, channeling an investigation from progressive fantasists published in The Nation that is so lacking in credibility that it was debunked by Slate and ignored by most of the Hillary-friendly media. Clinton does not mention that she made more campaign stops in Arizona than in Wisconsin. She forgets that she ignored the advice of her own husband that it was unwise to write off white working-class voters. She does not allude to her having hidden from the public about with pneumonia until she was forced to release information when a random bystander happened to make a video of her collapsing on a mild day in New York City. She doesn't reflect on her uninspiring speeches or her off-putting personality. Traster doesn't press her on any of these matters, and the anticipation of that treatment is why Clinton agreed to speak to someone like Traster in the first place. In lieu of all of this, Clinton seeks to present herself as the most forceful opponent of the Trump administration. Should the president be impeached, she'll be able to say, hey, I called it. But she isn't leading the national conversation, she's mouthing along with it, like any other retiree talking back to cable news at home. Even if the Trump administration proves to be the catastrophe she foresees, there is no reason the Democrats would turn back to her for a third run. Every time she draws attention to the Trumpian flaws that were conspicuous to all during the campaign, she doesn't hear the obvious rejoinder echoing in every American's mind, then why couldn't you trounce him? Sadly President Trump has had to have constant back and forth since his election with crooked Hillary because the woman just can't seem to accept the fact that she had her behind handed to her in the 2016 presidential election. Trump has recently pushed for Clinton to be investigated by the Justice Department for her, and the Clinton Foundation's part in the Uranium One scandal, which gave 20% of our uranium deposits to Russia. Listen up Crooked Hillary. The difference between Senator Franken's case and the cases of President Trump and Judge Moore is that in Franken's case there is proof. An actual picture of him committing the crime. As in the case of your husband having to settle the sexual assault cases, there is no concrete proof whatsoever of any wrongdoing on the part of President Trump or Judge Moore. Judge Moore, 